All right, here we are again. Time for some more physics. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the third chapter, which is all about interference of light. So let's get to it. This is the picture at the beginning of this chapter. Well, these are bubbles, obviously, and you've probably seen bubbles, and you've seen these very interesting color patterns and formations that happen. And it turns out these formations really only possible with, well, they're an outcome of light interfering, or interference of light. Um, a specific example of what we call thin films, which we'll talk about a little later in this chapter. I should point out that in the last chapter, and mostly in the chapter before that, we thought about light as like a ray. Like it's like this line that's just beaming along. There's no real way to use light rays, or to think about light as just rays, and get to interference. For interference, you really need to think about waves. Waves are things that interfere with each other. So the fact that light does interfere with uh, other light rays and with itself means that light has wave-like properties. So uh, we can't just use geometry and trigonometry and deal with rays like we did last chapter. And we call this sort of stuff to dealing with interference of light, wave optics, or uh, physical optics. Since we are dealing with waves again, I thought maybe we'd just do a quick refresher on the basics of waves. So here we have a uh, specifically a transverse wave, where the amplitude of this wave is perpendicular, going up and down this way, to the direction of the motion of the wave, along this way. And just to point out, you know, the amplitude is the distance from the equilibrium of the wave to its crest, or from that equilibrium to the trough. And we, those we call those crest and troughs. And we say crest, crest and trough a good amount of times in this lecture, so it's good to point them out. Another very important property of a wave is its wavelength. It's the distance that it takes from the wave to repeat itself, is one way of saying it. Or it's the distance from crest to crest, one crest to the next, one trough to the next, one point to that same point again. Right? So that's what the plot I've been showing there. Some other basic stuff about waves. We don't really need this information. I just figured since we're refreshing, Reminder that waves, another way to specify waves or other basic property of waves is the frequency, which is inverse of the period. That's so, and the speed is right related to the frequency of the wave. You don't necessarily need that, but good to remind yourself. Well, what is interference? Yeah. So waves do this thing called interference, which in one way you could say it's when two waves, uh, at least two waves combine to produce maybe a larger wave, maybe a smaller wave, maybe they cancel each other out and grow entirely. This is more familiar maybe with uh, water waves. If you watch water waves, uh, when, say, approach the beach or approach uh, an embankment of some, some, of some kind, then you see that wave sort of coming towards the beach, and it will reflect off that barrier and reflect back, and that wave traveling the opposite direction, if you watch closely, will actually interfere with the waves that are coming in, and if they're both peaked up, then you'll see that they actually get a little bit higher, they both combine and get higher, and then they there goes, and now keep going. Right? So that's that interference happening where they're combining. This is a pretty classic case of interference of waves where you just take two sort of plungers and uh, oscillate them up and down on the surface of water, and you end up with this pattern. Right? We call it an interference pattern of these water waves. So in the left picture is this sort of overview, this top-down view of this picture, and you actually see the ripples. You see, well, what's enhanced, I think, is the crests of these waves, of these wave fronts, or these the circular waves moving up. And what you might notice, or what you would want to notice, is that when two of those crests of the wave fronts combine, that's when we get this uh, amplifier, this like enlarging of the wave, right? So that place where the two overlapping circular wave fronts that are cresting, we get an enhanced one, we get a, this kind of bump. Versus the darker spots are sort of where the trough is in these waves, so when two of those troughs overlap, we get this sort of down spot. And then in the middle, we actually have flat areas, which are never talked about. When you're talking about interference of waves, there's sort of two extremes, and then everything in between, but a lot of times we think about these extremes, and it's helpful where you think about constructive interference, 
where the two waves that are coming together are combined to create a larger wave, and not just a larger crest, that's actually called a larger trough too, right? Because the, the amplitude is enlarged. And on the other side of that, you have destructive interference, where those waves are overlapping in such a way that when one is cresting, the other's trough um, at the trough, and they cancel each other out. You get flat. So these pictures show two waves when they are interfering. Well, if they do overlap them, or if they're overlapping the same space, you would, would get constructive interference for the left side for A, and destructive interference on the right side here for B. And you just, well, really essentially just looking at what the amplitude is at any given point along this wave, the two waves, and adding them together. So on A, you can look at any point along the wave, right? maybe that X that's indicated there, and what's happening with the, the second wave, well, look straight down, that's also higher, it's at its peak there, at this crest, X high. So when those waves combine and they interfere, the crests are lining up, and we get twice x, we get double the amplitude there. And like I said, the same thing with the trough. Both troughs are aligning, so we get double going downwards. Whereas the destructive interference, if you look at that same sort of point for wave one, and it's cresting, where wave two now is shifted, and it's actually at its trough. So when you combine that plus x and that minus, minus x, you get zero. And that same thing happens everywhere along that wave, because these waves are actually what we call perfectly out of phase. So whenever one is going up, the other is going down. Whenever one is going down, the other is going up. So we always can't see each other out. So destructive is perfectly out of phase. Constructive interference is in the opposite. We say they're perfectly in phase. Everywhere the wave one is going up, wave two is also going up. Wave one is going down, wave two is going as this note points out here, if we imagine trying to, well, what, how we would get from that constructive interference picture to the destructive interference picture, like I said, wave two has been shifted. Right? It's actually, if you think about waves in terms of their angles that that, you know, if it's a sine wave, the angles that sine has gone through, or the radians that it's gone through, um, it turns out that shifting from that picture A, shifting wave two, to, from A to B, we're actually shifting by 180 degrees, or pi. And in terms of the wavelength of these waves, so you could say we're shifting half a wave. This is just a neat GIF moving picture to actually show you what happens when we have one wave and then a second wave that it's actually shifting uh, relative to that first one. So something to point out beyond all this I've already said is that these waves are have a particular property, what we call them coherent waves. And coherent basically just means they're of the same wave. Or not the same wave, but they're they have the same amplitude, they have the same frequency, they have the same wavelength. All that stuff is the same. So when they're coherent waves and one is shifting relative to the other, we get this the result of that is just kind of this uh, change from perfectly constructive right there down to perfectly destructive there in phase entirely right here, all the way to perfectly out of phase, right? And you see wave one sitting still as wave two moves along, how we shift the wave two, that phase of wave two is shifting from being in phase, there's no angle difference between them, to being completely out of phase, steadily to 180 degrees, and then it keeps going, 180 degrees out of phase, keeps shifting till you get to 360 degrees out of phase, which then you're actually back to being in phase again. You go 300 degrees around, you're back to where you started. So one way you can produce or just work with coherent waves is basically split waves coming from a single source. And we do that extensively in this chapter. Mostly what we deal with in this chapter is coherent waves, where we have like a light source, and then that light source is uh, uh, whatever that those waves are split into two. So those waves are still the same. They have the same amplitude, same frequency, same all that stuff. So they're coherent waves. And that's pretty much what we're dealing with. In this chapter. So when we think of the waves we're going to talk about, you can kind of think of this picture. When you do talk about interference, especially interference of light and later on interference of other things, you can't really talk about that without talking about this famous double slit experiment, Young's double slit experiment, where you take uh, light, so the diagram shows monochromatic light, but Young was actually doing his experiment with sunlight, 
and essentially just had a very small hole where sunlight could enter into this room and then past that the, there was another block but those that block had two very small holes too so you go from all this light the same light coming in you narrow it down you get it to come through this one little spot so it then starts pushing out again and then it goes through the now these two slots or so these two holes and now you have the same way you have coherent light coherent waves emanating from these two different holes okay, that's the whole uh, or the needed background for this. We need the coherent light coming out of these two slits in this, area, in this case. And when that happens, it acts, or as far as the wave is concerned, as the interference pattern is concerned, it acts exactly like those water waves did. Right? When we had the two plungers that were creating waves from these points. The GIF here is actually showing that exact thing. If you have light emanating from this slit, or it could be just a, a hole looking top down, so it doesn't really, or maybe the side on doesn't really make much difference. But you have light coming in, spreading out, and then going through these two different holes. So we have these coherent waves now coming from these two different holes. And those waves are, or those two slits are acting as sort of sources for these new waves that are emanating out. And those waves emanate out, emanate out in these circular patterns. We get exactly like the picture we got with the, the waves, the water waves earlier. So if you do this experiment and you put this screen, or you put some kind of screen um, on the other side of those two slits, Right? We can actually show the interference pattern that's happening. At certain points, those waves, those light waves that are coming out, are going to be constructive. Some points they're going to be destructive, and they'll be when they're destructive and totally out of phase. That means they're canceling each other out. There's no light there, so that's where you get these dark bands. Right? And then between that, there's sort of varying amounts of constructive things happening, so you get dark light bands. Or light, light, dark, light, dark. Just as an interesting side note. In chapter one, and we talked about Huygens' principle of wavelengths. Right? Huygens was actually a contemporary of Newton, and he was pushing this idea of light acting as waves. And it, even in his time, his ideas were, you know, they worked to explain things, but given that Newton was a highly regarded figure, and he was pretty bent on light as just rays, it actually just kind of like beams. Turns out that he just kind of won out and people didn't really take Huygens all that seriously. That was in 17th century or something, late 17th century. It wasn't until like 200 years later that Young did this experiment to conclusively show that, yeah, if you do this with light, light will produce interference patterns. The only way you get these interference patterns is if it's acting like a wave. And as I pointed out multiple times, most of the diagrams, figures that are shown, a lot of times they need to be greatly exaggerated or else it's very hard to see what's going on. In the diagram here, the distance between those slits, that lowercase d, is actually very small, generally, really small, especially compared to uppercase d, the distance from the slits to the screen. So little d might be like a millimeter, and that capital D might be a few meters. Okay? So this is greatly exaggerated the picture. Taking a closer look at this interference pattern, and so we Covered some of the stuff in that other diagram, and we're just looking edge on at the two slits. So the slits, we kind of approximate or imagine that they're very, very small, so that they essentially act as point sources for like these Huygen, the Huygen wavelets that we talked about in chapter one. To understand what's going on, we just think that from each of those points, right, like point S1, there's this. Uh, circular wavelet that's propagating out, right? And we can, it just advances over time. Same thing for the second slit, S2. And the diagram maybe has too many lines on it, but it's essentially showing the wave fronts propagating outwards. And if you think about it, right in the center, right, right along the center line between the two slits, each of those waves from S1 and S2 will have traveled the same distance to get to that center point. So traveling, the same distance, they will have gone through the same amount of wavelengths, meaning they will meet at that center in phase, perfectly in phase. So that's why we get right in the center, we get this maximum, this maximum bright spot, very bright spot. And then think of, you know, as you move from that center, you move, say, up away from that center, then the wavelet that came from S1 goes a little bit less distance, but the wavelet, the wavelet from S2 it's actually going a longer distance. So you sort of imagine how many wavelengths is now 
going, it now takes from S1, maybe a little bit less, right? But it takes S2 a bit more, right? So now they don't meet in phase anymore, right? They start to kind of, as that picture was showing earlier, the, their phases are shifting away from each other, move up, 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 and eventually get to the point where they're perfectly out of phase, right? One's cresting, the other's troughing, and they cancel each other out. So you get this dark spot. So that's why we have this bright spot in the middle, move away, get a dark spot. Very similar sort of idea, we go below that, the same idea, you go below that, you eventually get to another dark spot. They're out of phase down below too. And then you keep moving away, right? Those waves that keep shifting, the amount of wavelengths from S1 to the screen and S2 to the screen keeps shifting, right? Because the distance keeps growing or shrinking. So we sort of have that same picture of those coherent waves just shifting past each other and eventually you keep moving away, they overlap in phase again, and we get another bright spot. That's why you say bright to dark, then the bright again, then the dark, and the bright, you get these bands, this interference pattern. If you look a little closely, you can see something else going on within this interference pattern. There's these smaller dark bands. That actually has to do with um, diffraction, which we're not gonna talk about now. Next chapter. Okay, so let's think now even more in depth just about the distance that each of these waves from the first slit or the second slit, the distance that it's traveling. Because that determines how many wavelengths it goes through before it hits the screen. If you look at this point P, well, it looks like the second wave, the wave from S2, is traveling a longer distance, it's gonna go through more wavelengths. But it's not necessarily longer or shorter that matters, it's whether or not they actually meet up in phase or out of phase. And what's going to determine that is if the distances they travel is the same, that's an easy one, they meet up in phase. If the distance they travel, the difference of that distance is equal to a whole wavelength, then they will be in phase also. If they, one of the waves essentially has shifted at least one wavelength difference, but that means they're back in phase again. Think back to the picture of that waves keep, is shifting all the way over, it shifts 360 degrees, 2 pi, a whole wavelength, it's back in phase again. So that's why we're showing that you can get constructive interference when the difference between those distances, R1 and R2, is any multiple of the wavelength of this light. Remember, it's coherent light, it's the same wavelength of each light here, right? So two wavelengths. So the alternative to that, or the other extreme of that, remember if you shift that second wave, once you've shifted it half a wavelength, or 180 degrees, pi, however you want to think about it, once it goes half a wavelength off, that's when the one was crushing and one was trapping, they're totally out of phase with deconstructive interference. So that's why when those, that difference in distance is any multiple of half wavelengths, you're going to get deconstructive interference. So that delta L just mean the difference between R1 and R2. And then M is an integer, any integer, positive or negative. It's also referred to as the order of interference. So think about, you know, starting at the center, they're both travel the same distance, they meet in phase, bright spot. Once you move away from the center, you get to the first point where the one from, say, S2 has gone a half a wavelength further than the right wave from S1, right? Now their path length is different by one half. So they're gonna be deconstructive, it's gonna be dark, and that's the first order deconstructive interference. So M just gives you the order, or sort of almost like the band, which band you're talking about. So eventually we want to be able to say something about where we're gonna see the bright spots and the dark spots. Like how can we describe that interference pattern that we would expect to see given the wavelength of light, given how far apart the slits are, that's the lowercase d, and given the distance from the slits to the screen that the light is falling on, it's that capital. All right, so we'd like to get a relationship for that, a quantitative relationship. And we can do that, as usual, we probably round up to approximate a little bit, but it turns out that you know, they're pretty good approximations. So the approximation we're gonna make is that at the screen, or at the slits, those light rays are essentially parallel. You might be thinking that's a little bit strange. If you look at that picture, they're clearly not. For the picture on the left, A there, 
They're clearly not parallel in that picture. Again, those that diagram greatly exaggerated. I tried drawing a triangle that's closer to what the actual distances R1 and R2 look like relative to the distance between the slits. Even that is greatly exaggerated. That's still like, you know, 10 times off at least. So the, the triangle that we're talking about, the R1 and R2, is extremely narrow, meaning that R1 and R2 from the two slits are actually very, approximately they are quite parallel right at the slits. So this is a not a bad approximation to make. So if we say that those rays are approximately parallel from the slits, then the angle to that point P, the angle theta indicated there, you can hopefully convince yourself that that angle is the same angle indicated from that top slit going perpendicular to the bottom ray there. So that angle theta is the same as that angle theta. That's very helpful because if you draw that line from the top slit that goes perpendicular to that bottom ray, what you've done is cut off the difference in length between those two rays. Right? So they're parallel, we're saying they're essentially parallel and they're all going over to P. You cut out that little bit, that little bit's the difference in path length. And that's useful because now these little very and now if we use just a little bit of trigonometry, we can say that the sine of that angle is going to be equal to the difference in path length delta L divided by D. D is the hypotenuse of that triangle. Delta L divided by D sine of that angle theta. Or The delta L, the difference in distance, is the difference, the distance between the slits multiplied by sine of that angle theta. So remember from the previous slide, right, when that difference is a multiple of the wavelength, we will get constructive interference. So now we can say that when D multiplied by that distance between the slits multiplied by the sine of theta, the angle to that point, when that is a multiple of the wavelength, we get constructive interference. The other end, the other extreme, when that difference is a multiple of half a wavelength, we get destructive interference. So those are our conditions related now to the distance between the slits and the angle from the center just from the center of the slit to that point P. Yeah, and there you go. You know, maybe written a little bit clearer, a little bit more detail, indicating that M is an integer, can be all these things. Um, there's an, another way, maybe, maybe a more compact way of saying this, is that when that D sine theta is an odd multiple of half a wavelength, you get destructive, and it's an even multiple, you get constructive. Okay, but what about, say, figuring out the distance from the center of the screen, that point C indicated there, up to where a constructive interference is going to be, right? Where, the, where a bright spot's going to be. How can we come up with an equation for that, for that distance Y when it's uh, constructed? Well, we're talking about constructive interference, right? So this was our condition for constructive interference. And if we look at just that triangle right from the center of little d to c up to p, then we have this sort of triangle and tangent then of that angle, theta, is going to be equal to y over capital D. And the book actually writes this with a little m. Yeah, I guess it calls it the distance from the center maximum to a bright range. And we can even do a little bit better than that, because again, 
this, the diagram is exaggerated. Think back on the other one, the angles that we're, the angle that we're talking about, this theta angle is actually a, quite a small angle usually too, right? We're going from this, these two slits, and the, um, the pattern that we're making is, you know, fairly narrow and it's pretty far away. So the angle that from here to, you know, the angle from the slits to either end of this pattern, less than 10 degrees at least usually, right? So we can use our small angle approximation and that one, remember, it says the tangent of theta is essentially equal to theta. And it also says that sine of theta, well, when we have small angles, sine of theta is approximately theta, tangent of theta is approximately theta. So we can relate um, some of these interesting quantities. Nope, just realized I didn't do that replacement correctly, right? That's the m order of the interference multiplied by the wavelength. So then if we solve for y, m, that distance from the center of the center right spot, right maximum, out to the center of the mth uh, fringe, you're going to get Which is good. It's all in terms of things that we probably know. The wavelength of the light, the distance from the screen, the slits to the screen, and the distance between the slits. And then M is just the fringe that you're talking about. And so if it's the first bright fringe away from the center, M is 1, and you can calculate the distance between the center and that bright fringe. You can get a very similar relationship or go through a very similar process essentially for deconstructive for finding the distance to the dark bands instead of this m lambda we would just use the deconstructive condition where delta l is one half m times the wavelength yeah. and just briefly to point out that we can compare or we can kind of think about one fringe relative to the other like the angle that it makes from the center of the slits. Right, we've been doing that already. That's kind of in our theta that we're talking about. And just as you might expect, the intensity of a wave of, uh, any wave, the light wave too, will fall off as you get further and further from the source. And so those slits are acting like our sources. And as you get further and further away from the center, the intensity of those waves is falling off. So what that means practically is that the light is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. That as that angle increases, you're sort of going to get it's going to be harder and harder to see these uh, interference patterns. There's also another factor that impedes how far out this pattern will go, which they look at that in just a second. But first, do this example. So suppose you pass light from a helium neon laser through two slits, where the slit distance, little lowercase d, is 0 0.01 millimeters, right? Tiny difference between the slits. And find that the third bright line on your screen is formed at an angle of 10.95 degrees relative to the incident beam. So that angle theta. What is the wavelength of the light? Okay, pretty straightforward. We don't even actually need the that ym that we found a second ago because we're given all this other information. We can just go back to our that first relation between the angle, the distance of the slits, and for constructive interference, it's going to be equal to m theta. And in this case, they're saying we're looking at the third bright line, so the third order bright fringe, meaning m is 3. Pretty straightforward, solve for our lambda, then. Put all these values in, 
going to get ooh, six times well six times ten to the minus four millimeters, which is six times six point three three times ten to the minus seven meters or six hundred and thirty-three nanometers. You look at a visible light spectrum, well, that's red light, some kind of red light, which is what a helium neon laser will put out. So that's good. Here we go. So this example shows one useful thing about this double slit is you can use uh, known setup distances, all these distances and uh, measuring angles in order to measure the wavelength of the light, of light. And not just, not just visible light, actually, you can do this with all kinds of electromagnetic waves just need to be able to detect them on the screen. So like I said a minute ago, before the other example, there's something else that's inhibiting the interference pattern from just continuing going forever beyond just the intensity of the light falling off. And that is the fact that this equation that we came up with for constructive and destructive interference has this sine theta in it. And sine theta is limited, right? It only goes between minus one and one. Yeah, so at the most, sine is going to be 1, and Rick, don't need to do this, I think, but if you put in the numbers involved in this uh, example that from the last, actually, example, so using all of that same information and setting sine of theta equal to 1, right, that's the maximum sine is going to be, turns out you get m is a little over 15 for the telling you that the furthest fringe that's going to be created is 15 uh, bright spots away from the center. In practice, even that 15th fringe is not going to be easy to see, because by that point, the light is going to be kind of dim. It's not, you know, that's something you might not even see with your naked eye. But even if you were had a powerful enough laser that would put out a lot of light, then you'd probably see that. Well, all of that was talking about just the two slits, analyzing maps with two slits and the light interfering between from those slits, what about three slits, four slits, five slits, right? Any multi-slit multi, multi -slit interference pattern. We're gonna talk about this much more because it really gets us into thinking about diffraction, which is next chapter. For now, just to point out that if we think about ray one and ray two here, as if it was just a double slit, you see the distances indicated on there. When ray one and ray two are half a wavelength, the difference in the distance is half a wavelength, right? That d sine theta there is half a wavelength. They'll be out of phase, right? So they'll cancel each other out, you know, like that. But then you still have ray three. Right? So it's not as simple as just the two waves um, being constructive and destructive. Right? It's more complicated. We'll get to that later. Right now, we're going to get to thin films, which can cause all these interesting pictures to happen like uh, bubbles, like show at the very beginning. Bubbles is an example of a thin film, and you, you get these cool, colorful patterns. The one on the bottom left there is just an oil slick, which you've probably seen with, with oil on the ground, and you make these rainbows. This one is, um, what is that? A layer of copper oxide formed on a piece of metallic copper. Right, That copper oxide forms a very thin sort of layer, and you get these thin film effects. So what, what is that? In a thin film, this picture sort of here is showing N2 is like that very thin layer of something. In a thin film, you have a light ray that will come in, and there'll be some reflection that happens. That's not ray one. There'll be some refraction that happens where part of that light goes into the material, and then it's reflected off the other side of that thin film, comes back out, refracts again. And so you have this combination of reflection and refraction happening with the same wave that is split at that interface. And the difference in path length that those reflected and refracted rays are traveling means that when they meet up again, they can be out of phase with each other. They don't, they're not necessarily constructive. Right? So the phase will change depending on how far that other, that sort of second light wave traveled. And that's why you can get constructive, destructive interference happening in these thin films. So the reason that you would get, you know, those colors in the pictures before is basically the, the thickness of that film, say the thickness of the oil slick, is just such that all the colors 
except for, say, like red, are bouncing in such a way that they actually meet back up, and those wavelengths are out of phase entirely, deconstructed, and so you don't see those colors anymore. The only one you see is the one that actually came through and was just right to be constructed. This interference that you're going to see is going to depend on, obviously, the thickness of that thin film. It's going to depend on the index of refraction of that film. It actually also depends on the index of refractions of the materials outside of that thin film. And when we say thin here, just like talking about diffraction briefly in chapter one, is saying that when you have this diffraction happening, it really only happens when the objects or the obstructions that you're dealing with are similar or on the order of the size of the wavelength of the light. Similar thing here, talking about thin, this, this sort of thing really happens when the thickness of that layer is not, not much more than a few times the wavelength of the light. But wavelength, you know, lights, wavelength of light is, visible light is very small, so that means, you know, less than about a micrometer, a millionth of a meter. Besides all that, there's one more complication here in that when a wave reflects off of a boundary, you can get phase changes to just do that reflection. So you probably saw this back in, I think, the first part of this uh, three-part course series when you talk about waves being there, right? You saw reflections and transmission of waves. So it turns out, depending on the speed that the wave travels in those mediums, which is indicated by the index of refraction, you might get reflections that are inverted or phase changed by 180 degrees, or you might get reflections that are not phase changed, not inverted. To illustrate this, I have this nice little gif where if we think about a wave traveling down like a string and then hitting this kind of boundary where the string becomes, in this first case, the thin string becomes thicker, this is very similar actually to, or conceptually at least, to a light wave going from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, right? The light wave traveling faster than the lower index, slower in the higher one, and so it's similar to this thin or to the thicker one. And what happens at that boundary, when you're going from lower to higher, you get a reflection, and that reflection is inverted. Inverted, or another way to say that, is it's been phase changed by 180 degrees. Whereas, on this bottom picture, if you have a thicker rope that's transitioning to a thinner one, then the analogous picture with the materials is that the index of refraction is higher in that first side, and then lower in the second side. And you see what actually happens if a wave travels through there, you get a reflection, but it's not inverted. There's no phase change. So depending on what that second material is, you got to keep that in mind when you're thinking of the reflection, because the phase of these waves matters when we're talking about interference. It's all about the phase. Yeah, so the top picture might be like light wave going from air to glass, you get a reflection that's inverted. Light wave going from glass to air, you get a reflection, not inverted. So this is a picture with materials like, okay, say, air and glass, or maybe uh, the thin film of a soap bubble. So that N2 maybe is like the soap bubble, and N1 is the air both above and below the soap bubble. So soap, roughly, you could say its index of refraction is like similar to water. Um, the key is that it's greater than air. Most things have index of refraction greater than air, or at least liquids and solids. Since N2 is greater than N1, when the incident wave comes in, when that first ray comes in, it's going to reflect Right? It's reflecting at that boundary where the index is greater. So when it reflects, it gets inverted. Versus the part of that wave that gets refracted and keeps going through, that wave eventually is going to hit the other side of the thin film. It's also going to reflect. right? But now that it's like going from the heavier rope to the lighter rope, we get a reflection, but it's not inverted. Right. So this is maybe a lot on the inside, but it's kind of laying out all these different possibilities that you might have. Right, where, just to tell you if you're uncertain about where there's going to be a phase change on a reflection. So also in a moment we're going to use sort of this picture and some of the sizes that T and stuff involved to calculate something about a thin film. And we're going to use this uh, kind of approximation, but also, I mean, not really, 
Like if you imagine that you're looking at a thin film and you're looking down on that thin film, you're looking like a, along a normal line, then the angle, the angles that, uh, and the light ray comes in and goes out, right? That angle is very small, right? It's almost going, you know, light's going down and up. It's not quite going down and up, but it's coming down at a very shallow angle to the normal, coming back up at a very shallow angle. So when that's the case, those rays in N2 are essentially are almost right on top of each other. And so the distance that that second light ray travels in N2 is basically 2T, twice the thickness of that film. 